This back to school season, let HelloFresh handle dinner. Their quick and easy meals take the stress out of mealtime, even on hectic weeknights. Get 16 free meals across seven boxes with code MLM16 at hellofresh.com slash MLM16. Small businesses were hit extremely hard during the early days of the pandemic, and many are still struggling to this day. Supply chains are in absolute shambles. The job market is highly unusual, and we have a long way to go before any form of normalcy returns. But back when this was all fresh, your favorite local grocer, the bakery down the street, and the boutique around the corner were all offered a lifeline, the Paycheck Protection Program. Hundreds of billions of dollars in loans were approved within just weeks. With this money, employees could keep their health benefits, their paychecks, and feed their families. The PPP was critically important so that these businesses could jumpstart on the other side of the pandemic. Bankers at Premier Bank who processed thousands of loans said that the program was extremely successful as they witnessed nervous, anxious business owners get an injection of some much needed capital. Many clients are now sitting on a very healthy balance sheet, according to Josh Toot, executive vice president and Mahoning Valley market president of Premier Bank. However, while Toot toots his own horn here, the data showed that the PPP wasn't all it was chalked up to be either. For one, the efforts helped out manufacturers and construction firms far more than industries that were actually in dire straits, like the hospitality sector. The New York Times stated that 17 million Americans filed for unemployment within this industry, and yet construction companies were granted about 14% of the $250 billion within the PPP program. Manufacturers secured more than 12%. As for accommodations and food services, they had less than 10% of the total, despite the high rates of job losses. So, all right, the PPP money wasn't really helping exactly who needed it the most, but at least the money was helping small businesses, right? Well, kind of. The money did help some, there's no doubt about that. Happy Cork, a wine shop in Brooklyn, had sales climbing in 2020, in part because, you know, people wanted wine to get them through the world that was crashing and burning but also because the demand for black owned businesses was on the rise. Ms. Foss told the New York Times that she couldn't keep black girl magic, the wine collection on the shelves. And that quote, I'm so happy now that there's huge customer demand, but it's bittersweet that it took all of this to get attention on these brands. She received about $2,000 from the PPP, which allowed her to weather through the early days of the pandemic and get back on her feet stronger than ever. As of late 2020, her sales far exceeded expectations and business was booming. That injection of cash may not have been a make or break for Foss, but it did give some aid. Aid that was frustratingly, by the way, denied for many. KB Brown owns a print shop in North Minneapolis, Wolfpack Promotionals, that opened up in 2014. It was temporarily closed in March, 2020, and Brown's wife took a job at a nearby Amazon warehouse to try and keep money coming in. Things were slow at the print shop in 2019, had been their best year yet, earning about $200,000 in revenue. We were looking at 2020 as a very big year for us, he told Mother Jones. At this point, I want a redo. And Brown sounds exactly like someone who could benefit from PPP, a small business owner that clearly just needed a leg up. Yet the money was running out and black owned businesses often faced another roadblock. Lenders focused on underserved populations had delayed access to small business administration loans. Essentially, all these billions meant to help people in need went out to those who could access it the fastest. And once it ran out, those who could finally access it, as Brown put it, were just screwed. Unfortunately, the issues with PPP are far worse than just the money going towards the wrong industries. Instead, the misuse of the COVID relief plan has become one of the biggest frauds in a generation. Countless businesses like Brown's print shop could have used that lifeline. Americans were promised that help was on the way, but that help had strings attached, lacked transparency, and could be complicated to navigate. Not to mention the loans are forgivable, essentially free money, making it all the more enticing. It's almost no surprise that scammers and fraudsters took advantage of that, effectively taking funds from small businesses' pockets. Hello everyone, and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati, and today I'm going to talk about COVID-related fraud. For those of you that don't know, the hundreds of billions of dollars in loans meant to help small businesses were given away on a first come first serve basis. But while small business owners scrambled, there were also individuals completely serving themselves. The Small Business Administration, according to NBC and the Biden administration, sacrificed security for speed when giving out PPP loans. As the chair of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee put it, the SBA might as well have said, apply and sign and tell us that you're really entitled for money. 
For fraudsters, this was an invitation, and they're believed to have swindled the program out of $80 billion in loans, or about one-tenth. Some of those happily accepting this invitation were well-known wealthy individuals, like Maurice Mofain, a star featured on Love & Hip Hop Atlanta. According to NBC, Mo committed this fraud to cover up an entirely separate scam, a Ponzi scheme he was running. He figured he'd use the PPP funds to pay off investors from his fraudulent trucking business, which he used to give himself this extravagant lifestyle that he just thought he was entitled to. This included wasting literally millions upon millions of dollars at casinos, but sure, he really needed that PPP loan. He was, by the way, sentenced to 17 years in prison for fraud and ordered to pay back more than $4 million in restitution, but he's far from alone. Anthony Bonsimino was ordered to pay about $800,000 and sentenced to 36 months in prison after obtaining over $2.6 million from four separate PPP loans. Now, Anthony was actually a business owner, it's true. He just didn't own as many businesses as he claimed and literally invented two completely fictitious companies to get loans. There's not much else said about this man or his case, but from the sounds of things, it was supremely easy for him to get his hands on this money. So that's probably why he did it. Maybe it started off as genuine and Anthony applied for this PPP loan because he honestly needed extra cash to get by. Then when he realized how easy it was to get the money, he got greedy and applied again and again and again. Now that's just speculation on my half. I truly don't know exactly where his mindset was. It's simply the fact that it was just so easy to do is what baffles me. Minimal security and precautions is one thing, but this feels like there were absolutely no steps taken to prevent fraud whatsoever. It adds insult to injury when you consider the fact that now, thanks to the government's total lack in preventing this fraud, dollars coming out of taxpayers' pockets are now going towards catching these criminals. What a fucking joke. Obviously, there are far more cases like this, and it goes beyond a couple of bad eggs fraudulently asking for loans. In late 2021, the Justice Department announced that a seven-member fraud ring was sentenced for their own multi-million dollar COVID relief scheme. The leader of this ring, like Mo, got 17 years in prison. Richard Avazian, as well as his co-conspirators, all used fake, stolen, or synthetic identities to apply for about 150 PPP and EIDL loans, EIDL being Economic Injury Disaster Loans. They also used this money to live the luxury lifestyle the group deluded themselves into believing they deserved. This included things like buying gold coins, diamonds, handbags, and expensive clothing. Though Richard got 17 years, the others got sentences ranging from a mere months of probation to six years. Now, Richard in particular is especially charming because just before sentencing, he and his wife, Marietta, who got six years, by the way, both cut off their ankle bracelets and fled, leaving their own children behind. They're a perfect match, all right, that's for sure. Now, they were captured and sentenced later, but as NBC explains, their case underscores how most defendants are freed while awaiting trial and sentencing, leading to some to go on and try and commit even more crimes. Elias Eldebag, who tried to steal $17 million from PPP, went on to attempt bank fraud while his case was pending. So I guess he just didn't think he had enough on his record quite yet. Another man used a $7.2 million emergency loan to buy a mansion and three luxury cars. A woman named Danielle Miller used identity theft to steal at least six figures. I could continue this list for a while, but I think you get my point. By March, 2022, 178 people were convicted. Some of these fraudsters have only been caught recently too, like the former owner of a painting company, Vincius Santana, who received $2.5 million from PPP. The announcement that he was arrested was released in just June, 2022, over two years after he fraudulently applied for the loans. And if you're curious about his type of loan, he claimed to have had 154 employees and a monthly payroll of over $1 million. Now, apparently he applied three times, claiming to have just five employees and a payroll between 10 to $18,000 and was denied. And on the fourth time, he decided to lie instead and miraculously was approved. So go figure. Again, the fact that he was even approved the fourth time baffles me. Earlier, when we heard that fraudsters just had to apply and sign and tell us that you're really entitled to the money, I figured it was a bit of hyperbole. Surely someone had to provide some evidence that they actually needed the money. They couldn't just claim random falsehoods. But honestly, reading about these scammers, it certainly does feel like the just apply and say you need it method was all that was done. Oh, and the painting company owner, Santana, used that money on cars and crypto, so it's not like anyone's getting that depreciated value back either. Chances are everyone who stole the money won't be caught. The Justice Department just doesn't have the resources to find everyone. And even if those caught reach 2000, not a mere 200, it will only ever be a small fraction of those that stole from these loans.
While it's pretty damn obvious that these downright con artists don't deserve these funds, there's also a few questionable requests that we're all too happy to be accepted. Like those of politicians who hypocritically enough are actually against student loan forgiveness. Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, received a six-figure PPP loan for her construction company. And that seems legit, right? She's just trying to be a good boss babe and help out her business, right? Well, it's a bit hard to believe she actually needed that money when she went around and donated half a million dollars to her own campaign after receiving those funds. Now, I just don't think that members of Congress should be getting PPP loans. If you can prove to me that their businesses received it and it didn't benefit them or their campaigns in the slightest, then I may not be so harsh on them, But the whole thing, as Aaron Sherb, the spokesperson for Common Cause put it, it certainly looks bad and smells bad. At least a dozen members of Congress benefited from PPP loans in total, with some of the money going to their fast food franchises, casinos, and hotels. Democrats also benefited too, like the law firm of Janine Shaheen's husband, but the biggest takers from what I've been able to find have been the Republicans, so sob and weep. Kevin Hearn's Tulsa Enterprise, which operates fast food franchises, KTAK, got between one to $2 million. Hearn claims that this money was used to keep workers employed, but the debates around if this is ethical have been relatively quiet too. According to Bloomberg, the Small Business Administration and Treasury Department have been unusually lax about properly seeing and administering this money, as we've seen. Just because the SBA waived conflict of interest and ethic guidelines and said these congressmen could receive money from taxpayer funded programs, does that really make it ethical? It's not as if the rules around lawmakers getting money are completely new territory. There are precedents set in place for federal officials getting money. Typically, they'd have to go through the Standards of Conduct Committee, a little known SBA body that handles these things directly. I think this is a great idea, ensuring that everyone is playing by the same rules and that any congressperson or federal official is going to use the loan only for its intended purpose. So while it's correct and awesome and amazing that this exists, Why wasn't it utilized? Josh Gottbaum, who worked in economic policy in both Republican and Democratic administrations had the same disgust and stated, the idea that the Small Business Administration can, without any review or publicity, secretly let all of its employees arrange loans for their family members or associates is outrageous. Naturally, there's also a bit of hypocrisy around this too, because Republicans are largely against student loan forgiveness. They've wanted to end the public service forgiveness program. But then I guess when loans apply to them, then it's fine, then there's no problems because they're entitled to free money, but not young college students drowning in debt. Got it, seems totally legit. Hell, their hypocrisy got so bad that even the White House Twitter account decided to point it out. And it's not just Marjorie Taylor Greene, it seems like almost every Republican that staunchly criticized Biden's loan forgiveness plan had themselves had their own PPP loans forgiven for thousands, if not millions of dollars. The White House decided to point this out in a pretty neat little Twitter thread. It was a dark Brandon moment that we will not soon forget. Yet as easy as it was for shady and questionable people to take money, it could be difficult too for small business owners to actually receive the money they deserved. Julia Vega, the owner of a jewelry business in Texas, said that she was approved for a $5,000 PPP loan. But once it came in, Capital One actually froze her bank account. For three weeks, not only could Vega not access her loan money or any of her other accounts, but she accrued late fees because of it too. It wasn't until the media contacted the bank's corporate office that her account was finally unlocked. Capital One said that this was because her PPP loan went into a personal account and not a business one. And huh, yeah, that that is a bit odd that Vega wouldn't have a business account if she, oh, wait a second, hold on. That's actually because Vega isn't a business owner at all, but a distributor for paparazzi, the MLM. And frankly, yes, I do consider her a fraudster too. No, she may not have lied in the same way that Santana did, but Vega, you don't own your own business, boss babe. Paparazzi is the company, you do not own paparazzi. It's at no risk so long as the sales force AKA you, continues buying the junky $5 jewelry. So nice try, but no. Doesn't it make you feel great though to know that MLM distributors were also applying for PPP loans and getting approved while legitimate businesses were being denied? Like, no, I don't wish dire financial situations on her, but I don't believe Vega should have been approved either when she doesn't own a business. MLMs are not businesses. I don't know how much clear to make that. Their corporations already were applying for these things. And even better, some of the worst ones were getting it. Do you guys remember the company Vema? I think I talked about them in mid to late 2020. You know, the pretty much defunct MLM that had to pay $238 million for being a literal pyramid scheme. Well, they got $200,000 from PPP money. 
Or what about Neora, who was sued by the FTC in 2019 for being a pyramid scheme while calling their supplements cures for neurological conditions? Well, they got 2.5 million. Or perhaps you've even heard of Zervita, Prove It, and Total Life Changes, who all got FTC warning letters in 2020 for promoting their products as being effective against COVID-19? The three of them all got PPP money too, and that was only weeks after making false health claims. Because nothing says, hey, stop marketing your products as a cure-all, quite like handing someone hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, right? But I am getting a bit ahead of myself as now we're starting to enter the business territory side of things, a new aspect to this fraud. Perhaps they weren't downright lying, but again, there were so many people picky dipping their little piggy fingers into this honeypot that really had no right to be there. While this isn't necessarily fraudulent, it still feels wrong that so many big businesses got their hands on PPP loans. The whole point of the PPP was to be a lifeline to the little guy, right? And yet Vibra Healthcare, a chain of hospitals and therapy centers with over 9,000 employees in 19 states received $97 million from the program. According to ProPublica, the biggest loan granted was supposed to be 10 million and Vibra's annual revenue was well over $1 billion already. Vibra did this by having their limited liability companies request the loans, 26 of them, by the way, all using the same corporate address in Pennsylvania. And uh, guess what? They got approved. Despite Vibra using the same location, hell, even the same bank for most of their PPP loans, the requests were approved. It could have been so fucking easy to look up the address for who was applying for these loans and be like, huh, like 26 businesses are all applying and they have the same bank account, the same address, the same everything. Maybe something's a little sus here, but no, the government chose not to do that. And when I say the most basic of precautionary measures were not taken here, this is what I'm talking about. Just literally double checking a fucking address to see if a loan had already been requested to the same place. This is basically the same thing as McDonald's saying, oh yeah, we're a small business because one of their locations meets the requirements of revenue and employee caps. Like no, Vibra, you're not a small business when you're a chain with a billion dollars in revenue. It's also not all that assuring when the CEO of Vibra, Brad Hollander, has said that he is never in business not to make money when he works in hospitals. And I get it that making a profit does matter, but man, there is something so discouraging when you hear about the asinine amount of money the executives in healthcare make, especially during a pandemic. Oh, but the loopholes, they get even better because a casino operator backed by hedge funds and two nursing home chains also received millions in loans. In fact, ProPublica identified $516 million that went to, and I wish I was kidding, just 15 organizations. Earlier, I explained how just $2,000 was able to help out a wine shop in Brooklyn and the desperation of one print shop owner felt when his wife had no choice but to work at an Amazon warehouse to bring in money after they were temporarily closed. Yet these giants received multiple loans averaging out to over $30 million each. And that's just, that's a fucking joke. Just imagine how invaluable that money would have been to people who actually needed it. Thankfully, I'm not the only one who's pissed off here. The fact that such an injection of cash into the economy was extremely helpful is great, but it could have been far more helpful if it actually went to the right people. Though we'll talk about more about PPP's effects in just a moment. Some chains like Shake Shack were hugely criticized for these practices and ultimately gave their loan back. But companies like Vibra take a little bit of a back seat, right? Shake Shack is front and center. It's a food chain, we all know what it is. You may not know who owns each of your hospitals. So it's a little harder to criticize them because they're just not front and center. And the truth is it's hard to know for sure what happened with the healthcare chains that filed as separate LLCs all with the same headquarters. One of the nursing home chains, Peterson, may have secured more than $50 million for their abysmally much below average ranked facilities. And already, I feel like those who applied for these loans should face some consequences. I understand that this isn't fraud in the typical way that other individuals like how they lied earlier. There were no fictitious companies here, that is true. But it feels worse because the money was sent to businesses here that clearly were all too often not ones that needed it. And in some cases, they didn't even deserve it. Like Vibra, who have been ragging on this entire section, did you know they actually had to pay $33 million to the Justice Department for defrauding Medicare in 2016? They were keeping patients for unnecessarily long stays to drive up billings. Now call me crazy, but I'd rather have $2 million sent to some asshole that's going to waste it on crypto and cars than 97 million sent to a healthcare corporation that's potentially going to use it to commit even more fraud, allegedly billing Medicare for doctor visits that didn't even happen. I say allegedly because even though they were fined $6 million, they didn't admit any wrongdoing. But naturally, it's the individuals not going to jail instead of anyone at Vibra, the nursing home corporations, or even the casinos. Of course, not only were companies double dipping in this honeypot, but about 600 of them had been barred or suspended from doing business with the federal government. 
According to NBC, they received about $100 million in total. That's $100 million that went to companies with seriously questionable histories. Questionable enough that the government went, no, we want nothing to do with you. But apparently not bad enough to stop them from getting free fucking money. NBC adds, quote, more than 350 loans worth nearly $200 million went to government contractors flagged by the federal government for performance or integrity issues. Over 11,000 borrowers had red flags in the government system for award management, such as mismatched addresses. With this much at stake, you'd think that the government could have implemented some fucking security, but it was so rushed that any security whatsoever was sacrificed. This does far more than just harm the, oh, small businesses that didn't get as much as they could have. It's putting millions of dollars in businesses that we shouldn't be investing in. The government even knows these companies were bad news. They've been flagged and yet they were handing them millions of dollars. And it's much the same for other COVID loans too. The Secret Service's estimate for potentially fraudulent economic injury disaster loans is about $100 billion. The utter negligence here is laughably terrible. It truly is. Juan Gonzalez, the US attorney for the Southern District of Florida said that this harmed taxpayers and those who needed the money as it ran out. He said, the public should be very angry. This is billions of taxpayer dollars that has been stripped from them, he said. And more angry should be the people who did lose their jobs, who worked for businesses that couldn't apply for this money because it was gone. Those are really the ones who should be the angriest of all. And Gonzalez is right about one thing. I'm definitely furious. To say the system was broken would be an insult to broken systems. But if it worked in the slightest, if it just boosted the economy a little bit and made things more bearable for the small business sector, then Wasn't it worth it? Well, let's find out and take a look at what the PPP really did and who actually benefited from it. And before we jump into that, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. First impressions are absolutely everything. So if you're looking to make an impact with your online content, then you need Issue, the easiest way to make your creative ideas come to life and share everywhere you want to be seen. You've created some amazing content and now it's time to post it on your website, share it to Instagram, and of course, send it to your clients. But if posting your creation everywhere includes reformatting, resizing, redownloading, and re-uploading, then you need Issue to help you out. Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials to magazines, to catalogs, portfolios, and more. There's no need for endless scrolling through PDFs because Issue features your creative in an easy to view way on every device. You make it once and distribute it everywhere without reformatting. Your content is already optimized for engagement and ready to share. And Issue also seamlessly works with tools you already use like Canva, Dropbox, and InDesign. So get started with Issue today for free, or if you sign up for an annual premium account, you'll get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and enter promo code MLM. That's I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use promo code MLM at checkout for your free account or 50% off your annual premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with promo code MLM. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away every single year? And if that's not bad enough, most cleaning formulas are 90% water, which is heavy to ship, leading to excessive carbon emissions. That's why I'm so excited to be working with Blueland because Blueland is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastics by reinventing home essentials that are good for you and the planet. They have the entire cleaning range available from your countertops to bathrooms, to toilet tablets, to laundry, which by the way, the laundry is my favorite. And like the wool balls that they also provide with your like little laundry kit are one of the best things I've ever tried. Plus, in case you're wondering, uh, the laundry does come scent free. Very important to me, at least for irritants. Now, the idea behind Blue Land's pretty simple. You just grab one of their beautiful forever bottles, you fill it with warm water, drop in a tablet, and you get cleaning. Refills start at just $2, and you don't have to buy a new plastic bottle every time you run out. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash MLM. That's 15% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash MLM. blueland.com slash MLM. The PPP was designed to help small businesses pay their employees, right? That was like the big goal. Here's the problem. Small businesses don't always have a lot of employees. It's a paycheck protection program, so it's covering payrolls. But what about when you've only got a few workers? Michael Minnis, an accounting professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business said, it wasn't called the Small Business Protection Program or the Micro Business Protection Program. Companies in the 100 to 500 employee range have more payroll dollars than companies in the under 100 employee range. That's just math. Hence why that cute little wine shop from Brooklyn only got a couple thousand dollars. There just aren't many paychecks to protect. 
Plus, as we mentioned with KB Brown's print shop earlier, minority owned businesses are at a disadvantage from the start because they don't always have strong relationships with banks thanks to years of systemic exclusion. Since the banks were only accepting loans from existing customers, this gives bigger and whiter businesses that leg up that we mentioned earlier. Many black owned businesses, especially in low income neighborhoods, use nonprofits called community development financial institutions. But can the CDFIs help you get these PPP loans? Well, probably not, since the Small Business Administration only approves less than 10% of them. Democrats initially demanded that $125 billion be set aside for small to mid-sized banks to reach more vulnerable entrepreneurs, but clearly negotiations fell apart with the other side, so you can see how that plan went. The PPP was meant to help struggling, underserved, and needy businesses, At least that's how it was pitched to us. But the flaws in its plan led to money going to large corporations that seemingly hurt more than they help and individuals that wasted it on crypto and cars. Big businesses took advantage of the free cash. And once again, the American people paid the price. But did the PPP actually help? Did the money that managed to get where it needed to go actually boost our economy? No, that's actually the worst part about this whole thing. The PPP was rushed out as a lifesaver, a saving grace only for it to be as much of an anchor as it was a lifeline. The National Bureau of Economic Research stated, we do not find evidence that the PPP had a substantial effect on local employment outcomes or business shutdowns during the first round of the program and find modest effects on hours worked and employee counts during the second round. The NBER added that since the program distributed a lot of money, but had little effects on employment, they question what firms did with the money in the first place. They too suggest that less affected firms received additional financial aid and that even if the program could have been beneficial, it didn't live up to its name. If you want to check out their study, it will be linked in my sources below as it has a wide range of data surrounding the issue. Now, in case you can't tell, I did get quite a bit angry while researching and looking over for this episode. The PPP did have potential. It could have helped a lot of businesses. It could have done so much for so many communities. And instead it ended up being the fraud of a generation. Truly, it's one of the biggest jokes that the government has passed off as help, but unfortunately no one's laughing. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I do hope that you learned something new because a lot of this information was really devastating, just the deepest, deepest effects of what was going on here. And if you did, please make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really do appreciate you staying with me through the end of today's episode. Please let me know your thoughts and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.